So I've been using the M1 MacBook Pro for quite some time now and with the rumors of the new M1X MacBook Pros, is the M1 MacBook Pro still worth it? Well, let's find out in my full review of the M1 MacBook Pro. Before I start, here are the specs of my Mac and I have the M1 with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. There is nothing fancy with it, I just wanted to give you guys a heads up so you know where are my opinions coming from. So let's start with the display and we have a 13 inch 2560 by 1600 IPS display and like the previous MacBook Pro, there is nothing bad with it. The display is very color accurate and like other Macs, I mean MacBooks, it's a 16 by 10 display which means you get way more real estate for getting your things done. There is an anti-reflective coating to prevent glare and let's not forget the very bad 720p webcam. Even with the new image signal processing, it's still not as good as an iPhone's front camera or a webcam. Like Apple can fit a very good webcam for the 24 inch iMac but not for the MacBooks. But hopefully the next generation MacBook Pro could bring a way better webcam than the current one. The design is very similar to the 2016 MacBook Pro except that you don't get the butterfly keyboard which is very bad but instead you get the magic keyboard which I'll talk about in a minute. Around the Mac we have two Thunderbolt ports on the left side and a headphone jack on the right side. If we had two extra USB-C ports it would help but it's fine for now. Let's talk about the keyboard and there are no words for it. It's way better than the butterfly keyboard on the previous MacBook Pros. And your mileage may really vary and you should try out this keyboard before you think about buying one because it's not similar to the older MacBook Pros but rather it's a hybrid between that and the butterfly keyboards. Right near the touch bar we have the touch ID sensor which is fast and handy. There is nothing much to say about it except that face ID on a laptop would be amazing. And if we get Face ID, we would get better webcams as well, I'm just saying. And let's not forget, on the side we have the speaker grills and it's pretty good. It's not as good as the 16 inch MacBook Pro which has one of the best speakers for a laptop, but it's better than many laptops, listen for yourself. Near the speakers, we have the microphones and they're great. I've been recording this entire voiceover on the MacBook Pro and it sounds great. And right below the keyboard, we cannot forget the huge trackpad that Apple ships on their MacBooks. Like seriously, why can't other brands really put really good trackpads like Apple? And it's just the best and their huge size is so good for gestures and navigating through timelines in Final Cut Pro. And since it's a four-stretch trackpad, you can click anywhere to perform the same action. And it'll be pretty trippy if you have never tried out this trackpad before. And now, I'm gonna talk about a part many people have been very interested about, and it's the M1. Ah yes, the M1. Now I'm not gonna talk much about the performance here, cause there are already a bunch of videos about performance on the M1. But I'll give you a refresher of the specs. So it has a 8 core CPU and a 8 core GPU which is comparable to the GTX 1650 in terms of graphics performance. And you find that in many budget gaming laptops and now yes, you definitely cannot game on Mac OS. But the GPU power gets used for many pro workloads like video editing where 4K timelines are very smooth and they render quickly. But I don't want to talk about performance here cause we already know that M1 beats many thin and light laptops but rather something that will make or break your overall opinion on a device and that's experience. Now Mac OS Big Sur has been built from the ground up to support Apple Silicon and it really shows through. About 70% of the apps that many people use are already optimized for M1 and there are a few x86 Intel apps that still remain and for that we have Rosetta 2 which works amazing. But again some apps still do have compatibility issues with it. But my overall experience has been quite good. I do a bit of dev work and I've noticed that Android Studio especially is still pretty laggy even though they say it's been optimized optimized for the M1. I currently run the preview version and I, I've got fed up with it. I just use it on my PC nowadays. But I'm hoping that the universal version comes out very soon. 
and other than that opening up word to finish up assignments is quick opening up multiple safari tabs doesn't slow down a lot and as an added benefit of apple silicon you get to stay away from the charger for a very long time now yes there are laptops that are cheaper than the m1 macbook pro and beat it in terms of performance but the trade-off for raw performance isn't worth it you see the only laptops that can beat the m1 are huge gaming laptops and you know those are heavy thick and let's not forget, not very good for everyday carry. Now of course, the M1 MacBook Pro has its downsides and one of the biggest ones are the lack of ports and the limited RAM and storage options. Like seriously Apple, two ports for a Pro machine isn't enough. If I plug in a USB-C drive in one side and charging port on the other, I'm already out of ports. The MacBook Air has the same amount of ports as the MacBook Pro, which is weird. Now you may remember I did specifically say I have 16 gigs of RAM on my M1 MacBook Pro and that's because something that Apple Silicon does too much on a regular basis and, and that's swap memory. So usually when a computer runs out of RAM, it tends to use the SSD as a memory and that affects your SSD's health in the long term. But here on M1 Max, it tends to use swap way often even in some cases where there is enough physical memory available to be used. Now many who have 16 gigs of RAM like me have no issues with this, but if we have an 8 gig RAM variant, I don't think so the Mac is gonna last for a long time. Also many people do say that 16 gigs of RAM on M1 feels like 32 gigs of RAM on a regular PC due to the unified memory architecture, but I don't believe that to be honest. Now my reasons for getting the MacBook Pro over the MacBook Air were the touch bar, the extra performance from active cooling and the bigger battery over the MacBook Air. And only one of the above reasons still makes me recommend the MacBook Pro which you'll find out very soon. I think you'd have guessed it by now. Now the touch bar isn't worth it. In fact, it's very annoying. I'm glad that the next MacBook Pro is going back to function keys. I thought I would use the touch bar for Final Cut Pro and some general tasks like browsing. But what I've realized is I've stopped using it that much due to it being really annoying. For example, this Siri toggle over here is so annoying and it's there by default. And if you're someone who uses this MacBook, just remove that thing right away because when you're trying to type, you might accidentally hit it. And the volume and brightness sliders are fine because you can quickly access them compared to a function key macbook but if you want to skip to a next song or something that now playing bar is very buggy it gets stuck sometimes so yes the touch bar should not be your reasons for getting the macbook pro to be honest and the next thing i said i got sold on to was the extra performance and i've never heard the fans pin up for many heavy tasks at all in fact 90% of the time where you would expect the fan to spin up, all you can feel is heat and it runs like a MacBook Air in 90% of the cases. Now that's not to say the fan has never spun up. When I render a few heavy 4K video projects, I have seen the fan spin up but not very loud as the Intel MacBook Pros and running a few benchmarks obviously makes the fan spin up. So I'm not saying the fan is useless but what you can take away about the fan in the MacBook Pro is it's not a big selling point. It's not as loud as the Intel Macs, which sound like a jet taking off. And it doesn't trigger for small tasks like the Mac older MacBook Pros. So you shouldn't be worried about that at all. Now the last thing I think the MacBook Pro has it going for is the battery life and it's just mind blowing. Now Apple quotes 20 hours of battery life and it's possible to achieve that target assuming you just watch videos and do nothing else. But getting a workday through and another with a single charge is amazing and it's not just that. If you can, you can actually squeeze in 5 days of use with a single charge. Now mind you that's if you do a lot of safari browsing but there are times I've edited a whole video for 5 to 6 hours straight with a single charge. Now, now mind you, video editing does consume a lot of battery due to the sheer performance needed. The older MacBook Pros last for only 2-3 to three hours with Final Cut Pro itself. So if you want to get the MacBook Pro, the battery life is the only real advantage over the MacBook Air. Now as many may know, there's a better MacBook Pro on the works and it's supposed to replace the current 4 port 13 inch MacBook Pro and the 16 inch MacBook Pro. And as I said above, I feel that the current M1 MacBook Pro has its downsides and one of the biggest ones is the lack of ports. The next MacBook Pro is supposed to bring way more ports, I mean essential ports like a HDMI port and an SD card slot alongside 3 Thunderbolt ports. And 
probably MagSafe, which people love apparently. Now, obviously, we will be getting a better version of the M1, and it'll be the M1X, and the rumors are quite interesting. The rumored performance benchmark places the M1X at around a 16 core Xeon in terms of CPU performance and the RTX 3060 or 3070 in terms of graphics performance. And obviously, with these Pro machines, we're gonna get way more RAM options like 32 gigs or 64 gigs. And the current M1 is currently limited to 16 gigs, which is a bummer for many people. And also, alongside the performance improvements that M1X is gonna bring, the display is supposed to be a big boost with mini LED technology which should bring brighter screens and native HDR playback like the M1 iPad Pro. And the 13-inch MacBook Pro is supposed to get a 14-inch display with slimmer bezels like many people want it to be because many people think that the MacBook Pro currently has very thick bezels, which I think it doesn't. Now, I really don't need an M1X MacBook Pro as of now, but for many people who think of switching to Apple Silicon with loads of RAM and storage, the wait for M1X would be worth it. Now, here are my final thoughts about the MacBook Pro and it's a good laptop if you know what you're getting it for. But for many people, I feel the MacBook Air is a better deal and you get the same M1, function keys and a very silent machine with no fans. But if you do need active cooling for higher workloads and a longer battery life, then the MacBook Pro is a better deal and you will know when you need a MacBook Pro. So that's about it for this video. Make sure to drop a like if you like this style of review and comment down below what M1 Mac are you planning to buy or what future Apple Silicon Mac are you planning to buy. And subscribe for some amazing tech videos like this and this is thank you and I'll see you guys in the very next video. Peace.